Okay, so uh, welcome everybody to this uh, research seminar. Uh, I'm very happy to have uh, Gunn Birkeland here. He's going to talk about gender discrimination in hiring, evidence from a cross-national harmonized field experiment. And uh, Gunn has a PhD in uh, sociology and is a professor of sociology in the Department of Sociology uh, at the University of Oslo since 1999. And, uh, she has uh, written uh, a lot about uh, labor markets, social stratification and inequalities related to gender and ethnicity. And uh, has published also, uh, also a number of books. I will just mention one is uh, Class and Stratification Analysis that came out in 2013. And also uh, recently uh, accessible for us who uh, can read Nordic languages. And excuse my Norwegian now. Hvordan går det med etterkommende etter innvandrere i Norge? I don't know if that was correct in Norwegian, but I tried. So anyway, uh, uh, you're very welcome. So please, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me. Uh, I have been affiliated with Institute for Future, uh, what's it called? Institute for Future Research. Um, uh, quite some years ago, when uh, when uh, Peter Hedström started his uh, group in analytical sociology at this place, so uh, I've been I've been visiting. I recognize the room that one of you were sitting in when I talked to you before, and I noticed Moa Dussel has a picture up, which is good. Hi, thank you for inviting me. Okay, so I will talk about gender discrimination in hiring, and uh, this uh, this paper has been uh, floating around for quite some while. So some of you may have heard this presentation before, uh, but since we are all pretty busy people, you know things take time. This is this is the outcome of uh, a data collection associate that we did in the Jam project, uh, which was a Horizon 2020 project, um, which uh, lasted until last year, I guess. And uh, GEM um, is the shortening for Growth, equal, equal Opportunities, Migration and Markets. And we get back to, to the topic of migration uh, later, because that's actually the main uh, reason that we collected this, um, this uh, data. And you see uh, the authors here, Bram Lancé at the University of Amsterdam, Edward uh, Larsen at, uh, in Oslo, uh, one, he took a PhD on this project. And then Javier Bolivieja, I'm not good in Spanish, <laughs> in Madrid. And Jonas Randl, who's both in Madrid and Vesebeer. And Ruta Yemeni, uh, who's uh, Wissenschaftscentrum, Vesebeer. Okay, so um, we, we start from the observation that the gender inequality in the labor market is uh, more or less omni present. It, has, uh, it persists in all areas of social and economic life, and it persists across countries. And um, we know that although, and this is perhaps a little paradox, that young women in, I think, all OECD countries generally obtain more years of schooling, higher educational level than young men. But still, women are less likely than men to engage in paid work and in full-time paid work, etc. And these gaps, they widen with age, um, as motherhood typically has marked negative effects on the gender pay gap and career advancement. First thing to do is to establish the phenomenon. Uh, because one thing is to describe uh, gender inequality, another thing is to say something about the causes of gender inequality. And uh, for all of us who know a little bit about labor market theory, we know that it's there is a, something called a supply side and a demand side. So the reasons for this gender inequality in the labor market is obviously very complicated. And what we will do here is only to look at a small part of this topic, which is hiring discrimination. And in fact, what's written here is not quite true either, because it's not, we are not able to measure employers' discrimination of young male and female job applicants uh, through the hiring process. This is only the first, first part of the hiring process we are addressing. Uh, we will do this by uh, collecting data across six countries and and we uh, as we get back to it the study is set up in a harmonious way harmonious way so that we can compare this data 
So uh, labor market discrimination is um, illegal in all countries we are addressing. It's unfair, of course, from a norm normative point of view. It's politically important because it can cause social frustration and protests. And it's related to growth uh, because if uh, uh, job applicants are discriminated when they try to find a job, it could mean that uh, uh, we as a society are not utilizing individuals' potentials and human capital. There's a lot of uh, political interest in this topic. And as social scientists, we know that we have to be careful, we have to be balanced, and uh, we need to come up with solid documentation. Uh, just a little bit about how we can measure discrimination using observational data. Um, we know that there is a lot of unobservable information that employers have that we as researchers do not have access to. And this means that if we look at the way employers behave, uh, we could interpret their um, decision making as evidence of discrimination, although if we had access to the same information as employers have, we might have decided that this was not a, a case of discrimination. There is also an issue related to the supply side in the labor market that if people expect that they might be discriminated against, they might decide not to apply for jobs or invest less uh, in um, uh, in applying for jobs and perhaps, and this is a topic that is often discussed now with regard to the immigrant children, that they might be likely to invest more in educational attainment. So uh, the fact that you expect to be discriminated can affect uh, your behavior. So it's really difficult to measure discrimination. If we look at quantitative data, they can document what we uh, talked about earlier, gender inequalities in a number of labor market outcomes. And it was, I'm old enough to remember the time when we used to interpret the so-called unexplained variance uh, in the, if we looked at gender gap in earnings or gender gap in, in uh, access to authority positions, for instance, um, several years ago, uh, uh, researchers would interpret the so-called unexplained variance as uh, evidence of discrimination. Presently, today, this is, this is not uh, acceptable any longer. There are a lot of reasons why we end up with unexplained variance in, in regression analysis of gender gaps in, in labor market inequalities. Then there is also the uh, possibility to, to uh, collect the qualitative interview data um, they can give us valuable information on how job applicants experience, it, for instance, a job search process. Uh, but obviously, they can people can say that, yes, I, I was discriminated. I applied for a job. I didn't get it. I have applied for 100 jobs. I haven't got it. I am um, all the time. People are discriminating against me. But job applicants don't know the details of the hiring process. They don't know who they are, usually at least, who they are competing with. Uh, they don't know the characteristics of their competitors. So we need to um, be aware that although people can feel that they are discriminated again, against, it could or could not be true. Uh, the same if you, if you interview employers. Uh, they can obviously would not admit to, to acting illegally. Uh, but they can also only give a small picture of the, of the whole story here. So qualitative data, of course, do, cannot give a representative picture of the labor market. I'm not saying that these observational data are not useful, because they are, obviously, but they cannot document discrimination. So if we want to measure discrimination, randomized field experiments is the, uh, regarded as the gold standard and is recommended by OECD in particular. So I guess some of you know about uh, these studies, but just a little repetition. In US, they call it all these studies, um, uh, which also, sorry, include uh, having actual people going to actual job interviews. Um, uh, we are more used to 
talk about correspondence studies in Europe. They also do that in the US, um, <clears throat> which means that we, we set up fictitious fake applications and we send it to real world <clears throat> uh, jobs uh, that has been advertised in, in uh, openly uh, <clears throat> for people to apply to. So this allows us to measure <clears throat> uh, employers' reactions to more or less identical job applications um, where we include one or several treatment variables, which is what we want to address to see if employers react to this treatment variable, uh, to see if, if they uh, are likely to discriminate on the basis of this uh, treatment variable. And here what we are doing is to test the, the effect of gender on employers' decision making. And how do we measure decision, their decisions? Well, uh, we measure whether they give uh, any kind of response or callback uh, to us as researchers. Um, and in particular, if they invite uh, our fictitious applicants uh, in for an interview. So previous field experiments uh, on uh, gender uh, discrimination show mixed findings. And, um, and um, there are some studies that found advantages for women over men, which means that men were discriminated against. There are other studies who found the opposite, uh, which means that women were discriminated. And there are also studies uh, which found no gender discrimination. And the fact that there are these mixed findings could reflect true differences across these countries. Maybe yeah. um, when when countries differ in the labor market policies, for instance, you would expect that this could uh, f affect employers hiring decisions. On the other hand, it could also be that these mixed findings is a result of the fact that the design in these experiments differ across countries. So since uh, they are national studies, we cannot really compare them. And here is a terrible table. You won't be able to see it. <laughs> we, have, we have tried to, to summarize previous studies on uh, gender uh, discrimination in, in hiring. Uh, and, and the interesting, to me, rather interesting um, uh, lesson here is that we learned that there are fewer out there than you would expect. These are only uh, randomized field experiments. A fewer than we actually thought at the beginning. So gender matters, it seems, but it, it, how is not quite clear based on earlier studies. Second, we look at occupational sex segregation because that also seems to matter. And and uh, uh, Riyash and Rich did uh, have done um, uh, a summary paper, actually two, where they say that more consistently across national context, field experiments on gender discrimination show that men are discriminated against when they apply for jobs in female dominated occupations and women when they apply for jobs in male dominated occupations. However, the discrimination that men are facing or male fictitious applications are facing when they apply to typical female um, occupations is stronger or higher than the discrimination that women were facing when they applied to what we could call male occupations. So it seems to be a symmetry. Uh, but it seems to be more discrimination on men if they go for typical female dominated occupations than the other way around. And again, uh, this is interesting, but we cannot directly compare because again, these field experiments, uh, they vary in their design. What occupations do they include, et cetera, et cetera. All these um, small details related to, to uh, um, uh, correspondence studies that could matter for the outcome. And, and these studies uh, um, um, are difficult to compare them. So just a little note on theoretical considerations. Um, 
I should say immediately that uh, uh, we like to talk about theory, of course, and we should. But uh, uh, in fact, the way we set up these studies, these experiments, uh, means that uh, we cannot really give a strong feedback to theory. Uh, we cannot differentiate between, for instance, a rational choice logic or a cultural uh, logic related to why do employers behave the way they do. So I think it's fair to say that these correspondence studies, they are strong in some aspects, but not so strong in other aspects. Uh, and in particular, uh, I think it's correct to say that this is more Although we, we could argue that we have a causal identification of the gender uh, discrimination, but it's still rather descriptive, um, uh, the way we set up the study and the findings we get. We can talk about that later. You may disagree with me. Um, anyway, um, employers can, the, the perspectives that are commonly uh, uh, used when we are talking about discrimination is related to the idea that employers um, are looking for um, uh, applicants who are supposed to be productive if they hire them, right? So um, the usual Russian choice logic would say that employers would hire the applicant that they find is the mo has the most um, highest expected uh, productivity. So, but there is a risk involved here because employers cannot know how people will behave if they are hired, right? Um, and uh, if they believe that members of a particular group are more productive than others, they might regard group membership as an informative cue. Um, and this would then be a topic of uh, differences in what they expect is the average of unobserved, unobserved uh, expected productivity. Um, if this difference is correct, we used to talk about this as a version of statistical discrimination. More and more recently, um, uh, researchers also include, and I think that's fair if you go back to the old literature, Researchers would also say that even if the expectation is wrong, um, it would still be a version of the same logic, right? So they can have uh, they can have stereotypes about certain groups, and they could be uh, actually wrong, but still the employers might act on them. Then, in addition, there is this logic of. Uh, the variance in unobserved expected productivity. And this was a critique that came early in the 90s by Heckman and Siegelman as a critique of these kind of field uh, ex studies or field experiments. So they say even if employer, even if employers beliefs are correct in terms of average group level characteristics between, for instance, two groups, um, they can be, uh, there can be differences in the variance of the unobserved expected productivity. And if that is the case, then um, the experiments, uh, these uh, data from these field experiments will not be very informative. This is a little sort of difficult to grasp, but here is a picture uh, where you can see the, um, the logic is that we have two groups here. Uh, one is blue and one is red, could be men and women. And the way it's set up here is uh, an example of uh, what it would look like if the, if the employer we are talking about um, believe that the, the blue group is more productive on average than the red group, right? Which is why we have this difference in the average um, average measurement of productivity, which is on the x-axis. But they have the same variance. So so the idea is that there are um, an average productivity within uh, each group, and they have the same variance. Um, but here is what it would look like if you think that two groups have, uh, uh, the, even in this situation when they have the same average productivity, but the variance differ. And then depending on the logic says whether you, the threshold for looking at the applicants you have, whether it is below the average, which is the left 
figure or above the average, which is the right figure, you would uh, this would affect employers' decisions if they have this belief, for instance, that I often think about immigrant applicants compared to the native Norwegian population. So if the native population uh, it has a smaller variance than the immigrant population, because there is more uncertainty related to the immigrant population, in, in the right uh, hand figure, employers would nevertheless prefer immigrants, right? Because the threshold is so high. So the likelihood that you would find more people up there in the immigrant group is larger. In the left panel, the threshold is below the average. And uh, of course, here, there would be um, uh, hardly any reason for employers to, if they believe this was the situation, to, to give a call back to an immigrant applicant. Okay, I'm getting a little out of here, but this is one of the, I think, rather interesting discussions on how do you, how can you interpret the findings that you, you get in these studies? And of course, this is a very economic way of thinking. Um, um, but as I have referred to at the bottom here, um, there is one economist uh, in, in, in Belgium, uh, Bert, who has found no evidence of this kind of bias related to gender heterogeneity, this kind of bias related to different variants. Okay, so I just want to mention it that when when we are looking at gender, uh, we could be safe, hopefully. <laughs> uh, anyway, we are not testing this. So, all right. So there is this logic of statistical discrimination, which would imply that em employers might prefer to hire men who are equally qualified to women if they expect women on average to be less stable, for instance, right? To women have children, etc. cetera. Um, there is also a logic related to unobserved gender differences in learned productivity, uh, which could benefit females in female dominated occupations and, and the other way around. Uh, are girls being trained to be more caring uh, are boys being trained to be more technical? Socialization of uh, boys and girls could imply that there are some unobserved gender differences in, in, uh, in their personal characteristics. Then we have the um, perspective related to cultural tastes and stereotypes. And, and this could go both to uh, stereotypes related to how uh, employers regard male and female applicants, but it could also be related to stereotypes related to the jobs. Uh, is this a, uh, so the literature on sex typing of jobs or occupations is important in, in this aspect. Um, would some jobs be regarded as typical female uh, jobs and other jobs as typical male jobs? So, um, Again, we cannot test this perspective, but it's it's interesting to to carry them with us. Uh, yeah, this is this is the same. The gender typing or sex typing of jobs, I think, is important in this literature. Okay, so the expectations that we have is that, first of all, uh, given the fact that there are these gender gaps in the labor market that we started out with we would expect to find discrimination against women. The gender gap uh, shows that men are doing better. So things are not quite gender neutral. However, we are in this test looking at younger workers and we expect that there would be less discrimination among younger job applicants, <clears throat> gender discrimination. So we expect to find um, not large gender differences. And since we have this literature on occupational sex segregation, um, we would expect to find discrimination of men in strongly female dominated occupations. Um, and the reversed only, we should say, we don't have data on heavily male dominated occupations um, in this study. Um, so, the whole logic behind this uh, study is the need for um, cross-national research, um, harmonized uh, field experiments across countries, 
And now I, I get back to what I said about uh, the M, one of the M in GEM, migration. Uh, we should be very clear that the reason we set up this um, cross-national uh, harmonized field experiment was primarily because we wanted to measure ethnic discrimination. But we have included in each country 25% of the applications from uh, the majority population because obviously we need someone to compare with to, to measure ethnic gaps. So these are the these are the the data we are using for this study. We are only looking at the majority population in each country, and we have much lower n because we are only including twenty five percent of the data. Okay. All right. A little bit about cross national differences. Um, the country we have included are Germany, Netherlands, Spain, uh, typical, more or less typical continental welfare states, if we are using Josta Asping Andersen's uh, classification. Uh, we have UK and US, which are classified as typical liberal welfare states. And then we have, uh, unfortunately, not Sweden as well, but uh, we have Norway as a typical social democratic welfare state. Um, and if we look at attitudes, there are <clears throat> studies showing cross-national variation in how uh, people uh, respond to questions on gender roles, uh, whether they think it's a good thing or not, that mothers should be working, etc. So there are cross-national differences in uh, gender role attitudes, but they are not very large. And obviously, we uh, these survey data, they tell us something about a small sample of individuals within each country. We don't know if employers hold these attitudes. And even if they did, we don't know if, if their attitudes matter to their hiring decisions. Um, we, this is another table you, I don't expect you to see, but we in the paper, we include um, uh, some information on these countries. You can see we have the countries on, on, on the left side of the table and then we have some um, um, yeah, factors potentially associated with gender discrimination, such as uh, is it difficult or not to, to dismiss people? Then that could influence employers' decision. Uh, what's the duration of uh, the paid maternity leave? How much uh, money are, are the state spending or the municipality spending on childcare, etc.? Unemployment rate, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is just to, to give us some idea about whether or not we should expect to find country differences in discrimination. And what we say is that. Uh, no matter how many balls you throw up in the air, we only have six countries involved. <clears throat> and uh, we cannot really have any strong ideas about uh, whether or not this national context should matter. But we believe that they might be, um, there might be, <clears throat> we expect that the probability of observing gender discrimination in hire, hiring uh, might be higher in, in countries where the costs of job mismatch are high and um, where traditional gender norms prevail, uh, in particular uh, expressed in, in people's attitudes. But um, this is very tentative. So let, let me now get to the study. Uh, in total, if we include all jobs we applied for, uh, we're talking about uh, uh, more than 19,000 jobs in these six countries. Um, we have six core occupations. I'll get back to them. We have only sent one application per vacancy. So this is a slightly different design than many of us have uh, used before, where we send two applications per vacancy. Again, this was not set up to, to only measure gender. In original data, we have 53 national origin groups. We have a number of treatment conditions. Uh, we have set up a software to, to automate the application procedure, which is out there. Anyone can get access to that. And what we are doing here now, as I said, we only look at the data from the majority population in each country. Um, 
we have sent applications more or less in the same way that most those of you who have conducted these studies before would know about this. Um, we are trying to, to set up a CV and an application letter which uh, responds to what they are asking for. Um, and we are then recording um, uh, the response from the employer. The characteristics that we are uh, interested in checking uh, are randomized, of course, which is, includes also gender. Uh, here's uh, information on the occupations. There are six of them, software developer, sales representative, receptionist, shop assistant, and administrative and accounting clerk and cook. So we had endless discussions. We needed to find occupations that would be about comp as comparable as possible across these countries. Uh, we wanted to have uh, low uh, educational occupations up through high. Uh, we had to stop. We could not uh, go up to master level. So the highest we have is bachelor degree. Um, we also wanted to have something, uh, a difference between some occupations have customer contact and others have not. And the reason for this, of course, is that we were primarily interested in measuring ethnicity. And, uh, you know, if, uh, if a job has a customer contact or not, that could um, matter for employers' reactions. So here they are. And um, I can tell you right now that if we had only been interested in measuring gender discrimination, uh, we would have uh, tried to include some heavily male dominated occupations as well, but we haven't, unfortunately. So first of all, we are talking about occupational sex segregation here. Um, so this is the national proportion, not in our data, but the national proportion of female employees in these countries we are looking at, in each country, right? So these are data from the labor force surveys. And, uh, and uh, uh, you can see that some of, it, it's interesting to see that the same occupation has a fairly large um, variation in terms of the proportion female um, uh, in, this, in the particular occupation within each country. Uh, and in particular, the payroll clerk is a typical female dominated occupation. The same as the receptionists and uh, the same uh, uh, store assistants. So there are these three occupations that are uh, fairly strongly female dominated. And then we have cook and sales representatives somewhere in the middle. And then the software developers is uh, a male dominated occupation although it's not a typical male dominate, it's a special occupation probably because it's a more modern occupation and people in computer science are, uh, if you want to measure discrimination of women in heavily male dominated occupations, then software uh, developers are probably not the best occupation to include. But it is interesting, of course, to, to measure it. So these are the occupations and the national percentage of women in, in these occupations. Then about uh, the job candidates, um, they differ in age because the educational uh, credentials differ across these occupations. They are all set up with four years occupation specific work experience at two different employers before they sort of applied for the jobs we were looking at. And uh, um, yeah, uh, we start with uh, examining the cross-country variation um, and documenting the callback ratios, and then we go up, go move over to to pool the data. Uh, so here is something again you cannot read, but this is a huge table which shows within each country, each occupation, um, uh, how many male and female uh, uh, applications did we send? Remember, we only send one one application per job, then uh, the callback rate, and then the callback gender ratio. And the PE at the right tells us whether or not there are significant differences in the callback uh, for the male and female applications. So this is within, within each country, within each occupation. Uh, this is more easy to read. Uh, this is 
um, a very basic linear probability model within each country where we just regress a callback on gender. And as you can see, uh, the gender coefficient is positive. Uh, female is one, which means that there is an advantage for women, which means that men are disadvantaged or discriminated against. In UK, in um, Spain, Germany and Netherlands, not in Norway and not in the USA. Um, Yes, uh, I should also mention, I think it's interesting to see that the, the constant term differs so much across these countries, in particular in Germany and Netherlands, we had really high, high callbacks. These are all um, done with uh, with occupational controls, since the number of uh, applications per occupation vary across the countries. This is the same analysis, uh, just plotted in a figure, which is easier to read. You see there are rather wide confidence intervals here, which is related to the fact that the N is not too large. Um, I can go back and show you. It varies between 913 in Spain to 502 in the in, uh, US number of observations. Okay, so this is the effect of gender. Uh, on the callback probability. And we know that um, Spain, uh, Netherlands and, and Germany uh, and borderline UK uh, seems to be, um, you know, to have si significant uh, coefficients. But they are overlapping quite a bit, right? So if we want to say something about whether these national differences uh, are significant, uh, then we need to do another kind of analysis. And this is what we do when we pool the data. So if we look first separately, uh, just to summarize, the country-specific estimates uh, actually show that in, in two countries there are no um, gender discrimination, whereas in the other countries there are gender discrimination, and then it's, it's, it's men who are discriminated against in these occupations we have. So you could argue that the our own study adds to the heterogeneity of the findings that are reported uh, before. Um, but uh, the fact that we actually can test because these data are comparable means that we can pool the data and, and test if the interaction term uh, gender by or female by country, if that one is significant, this means that these con country differences in the coefficient uh, associated with with the female um, uh, it would then uh, matter. Then we could say that yes, there are uh, country differences in in gender discrimination. So this is what we did, and this again is difficult to read. Uh, but we are for each country trying to compare with the others, right? So we, these are a number of interaction terms. And if you are able to see anything, uh, there is only one of these interaction terms that are significant, and that is um, female by Germany when we compare Germany to US, and the other way around, um, uh, female by US when we compare US to Germany. So there is one interaction term that is uh, significant, borderline. And with all these coefficients, you, I think a statistician would argue that you might expect that just by chance. Uh, so there are country differences in the overall callbacks. But when we pool the data, uh, we argue that there are no statistically significant differences across country, countries. So there are no cross-national differences in gender gaps in callback rates in our data. Then we also, of course, checked for as uh, I haven't told you that, but we are using the more uh, the wider definition of callback here. But uh, a more narrow definition of uh, employer responses would be invitation for an interview, and uh, of course uh, we checked that, and it's, it's the same pattern uh, when we look. Uh, there are some differences when we look at each country separate. 
it seems to be differences at least. But when we pool the data and do it the real way uh, and test the interaction terms, uh, they disappear. They are not strong enough. So we think that this is interesting because we have included countries that vary in a number of um, you know, dimensions that could potentially affect employers' behavior. Um, we have included occupations that are perhaps not ideal for this kind of study, but they vary in skill requirements and customer contact, which is important. Uh, so we think that, uh, uh, well, we should advertise that this is, this is uh, uh, an important study and, and we think it's a robust, fairly robust piece of evidence. We find no evidence of young women being discriminated in the first phase in this hiring process in any of the occupations we studied and in any of the country, countries we studied. Uh, so the first expectation we had has, um, has, uh, we, has not been confirmed. Uh, we found hiring dis discrimination of men in, in uh, four countries uh, and where male applicants were less likely to get a, a callback or response from employers when they applied for for specific jobs. As and these are the female dominated occupations. Uh, I didn't emphasize that very much here, but it's the it's the typical female dominated occupations where men are discriminated against. When we pooled the data. We found no statistically significant differences across the countries, perhaps then with this contrast between Germany and US. Um, so one possible explanation is that the, uh, if gender stereotypes and uh, gender typing of jobs are um, the reason for the findings, it could be that these stereotypes are so culturally embedded and fairly universal across countries that um, uh, employers or hiring agents are similarly influenced by these views. Um, or it could be that some of the other perspectives that I said we cannot really test this um, um, also uh, matter to employers' decision making in the same way. Although they are uh, situated in countries with fairly uh, fairly large differences in uh, in particular in some of the labor market policies they have to relate to so if it is true that this is related to gender stereotypes we don't know again i, I said we cannot really test uh, give a good feedback to the theory but if if this is related to gender stereotypes um you could be pessimistic with regard to the possibilities for policy reform to, to change things. Um, uh, and also in particular, uh, the fact that some of the typical male dominated occupations are, are gradually vanishing, uh, which are related to the old industrial society. So in that case, uh, one might think that the future doesn't look uh, nice for young men. On the other hand, if gender neutral occupations are growing, uh, then gender stereotypes perhaps will be less important over time. Um, so anyway, we have uh, both a cultural and a structural argument and, and uh, future research should benefit from uh, addressing them both. Uh, I should also mention uh, before I finish, limitations, of course. Um, this data only tells us uh, uh, something about the first phase of the hiring process. So we, we don't even follow the whole hiring process with this data, but they are strong for what they tell us, but they are limited also. So we can say nothing about uh, whether who actually in the end get hired, uh, at what wages, uh, what career opportunities, etc. These data cannot inform us about that. Uh, also, we are looking at fairly young applicants uh, that we are fake applicants uh, at the initial stages of the hiring, uh, yeah, of their own actually uh, working life. We only have six occupations here. Uh, all these studies uh, only pick a limited number of occupations in the labor market, so we cannot cover the whole labor market. Uh, and jobs requ requiring master degree, uh, we could not go for, uh, for a number of practical reasons. 
And I would also say, since uh, I'm first author of this gender paper, that it would be nice if we had more uh, strongly male-dominated occupations included, or traditional male-dominated occupations. Um, yes, but we found a differential treatment of male and female job applicants in all countries, um, a very similar patterns across countries. Uh, and we think this is interesting, with uh, given that these countries differ in so many ways. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm sure there's going to be many questions, so I will just remind everybody how we're running this uh, question and answer period. Uh, first, the first half hour of this question and answer period will be recorded, but uh, the latter part will not be. So if you prefer not to be recorded, it's better to ask a question towards after one half hour. Uh, we will use the chat function to run the question and answer. So if you w wish to ask a question, you should write that in the chat. And as we are a mix of research from different fields, we would like you to also write your area of study so we can uh, ensure that you take questions from different disciplines. So write your name and area of study, for example, Joe philosophy. And we also allow for follow-up questions. Uh, then you write follow-up and t uh, the name of the person that just asked, like follow-up to Gustav in the chat. And, and we take the follow-up before we take new questions. I mean, it's your turn to ask question. I, I will call upon you and you will put, so speak, in the spotlight so you can ask your question. Very good. And um, since no one has yet written in, I will ask the first question. And uh, uh, I'm sorry if I start with a theoretical question since I'm a philosopher. Yes. Uh, but I... You did mention in the beginning some uh, theoretical consideration about rational choice theory. And uh, there, there was the assumption that, that uh, the employers maximize productivity. Now, as you very well know, rational choice there, you say that you will maximize whatever is on top in your utility function, how you order things. And it seems to be a little bit of a jump from uh, maximizing productivity to, uh, to what people could have in their utility function. For example, they might have enjoyment, so they might be more willing to employ people perhaps who are not so produ as productive, but they will have more fun with them. Or people that, uh, you know, we know that respect is very important for people. So they might uh, employ people that they think will show them more respect or something like that, or, uh, and similar things. And, and uh, then of course, uh, you might think that this is not as important in big firms, but then we have the principal agent problem that uh, even though maybe the owners, they would like us, us only to hire people to maximize productivity, but the people who do the actual hiring might take other things into consideration. Of mm -hmm. course, all of this is compatible with the rational choice there, but it's not compatible with the idea of maximizing productivity. So I wonder a little bit about the jump there. So if you could tell us more about that. Uh, then I had a sec oh, sorry, let's go. Okay. No, well, I was just going to, I was really brief and, and not very clear about the theoretical uh, underpinning of this study, because as I said, uh, I, I feel very strongly that uh, we have this ambition that we want to give feedback to theory. Uh, and, and in particular with these kind of data, which I would defend are very strong data. They are limited, but very strong on the focus they have, right? All, all uh, experiments should be that. Um, and then we want to say something to theory and we really cannot. So um, I would just say that as a sociologist who's been working with labor market uh, issues for a long, long time, I would expect that employers are interested in productivity first, uh, first and foremost. They would probably be interested in other aspects too. But there is a, a discussion of what do we mean by productivity. And sociologists, we have a different idea, I think, or a little more mushy idea about productivity <laughs> than many economists have. Um, so, you know, um, we would say that if, uh, well, at least the, all this can be disputed, but you could, for instance, argue that whether a person fits in um, is part of the productivity uh, evaluation. So you could say that, okay, I have some candidates here. I expect them to be equally good to do the tasks that are needed to be done, right? But one of them is a difficult personality. The other one is not. And I would then go for the more, you know, um, nice guy, right? Is that the productivity-related uh, 
topic. I, yeah, I think uh, also even econ economists would say that. Yeah. So, uh, but uh, I wouldn't expect employers to to maximize uh, uh, happiness. <laughs> not not as a hiring agent. Not only, but it might uh, be one of the things to take into consideration, which means they are not maximizing only productivity simply. They, they will uh, yeah, yeah. take yeah. other considerations. They might yeah. also, to go back to the principal agent problem, they might very well hire people, people do the hiring that they think will be good for their own career. For yeah. Example. Oh, yeah. Think, yeah. So and, and, and this idea that you want to hire people who are uh, similar to yourself. Homophilia too, yeah. That, that's... Uh, that's of course uh, there too, but mm. but I, I was also interested in the concept of productivity because uh, uh, I wonder if there were some kind of more uh, exact definition there. Because of course, as you said, there are many things that you can put into the word productivity. I mean, uh, it would be also uh, things about uh, whether this person will stay for a long time, so there's not a yeah. sunk cost in the hiring procedure and things like that. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I mean, okay, this is a big question. I mean, it, most most uh, firms and and public offices as well would uh, need to invest in the people they hire. This this is not related to our study, but the, the way we think about this process, right? So there is something called uh, called um, firm specific training, and the fact that you want to do that as an employer or a hiring agent that uh, you you know that when you hire people they would need to have some kind of training period before they're able to start working and uh, this would also mean that from a productivity logic you would want them to to hang on to the job for a longer time and there was this uh, discussion which is old now about uh, the internal labor market could be very good once you were inside because you were well taken care of by the companies, but it could also be a trap because the skills you get as a as an employee inside an internal labor market uh, would not necessarily be transferable to another uh, company. So it could be a kind of a trap for the employees that uh, you are protected inside the company, but you cannot, um, um, you know, uh, have the exit possibility, and that could affect your your um, uh, your arguments if you wanted to raise your wages, etc. Right. So this this uh, discussion that I think is it's a bit old because um, I think the the old big firms with these internal labor markets are more or less uh, hardly exist any longer, and the competence is more or less across the uh, is is possible to. To be mobile across companies uh, to a higher degree now than it was before, at least in, in this kind of uh, these kind of huge organizations. So uh, I don't know what to say. I, I guess that we have, at least I have, in the back of my head. This is not something we are testing, but in the back of my head, I have some idea about employers uh, being interested in hiring people that they perceive as potential productive for the job they're supposed to to start in um, and that they also would have some uh, something in the back of their head that they would want uh, uh, workers to stay at least for some period. And I think this is one of the reasons that um, if there is discrimination of women, which we didn't find here, uh, it could be related to the fact that they have been regarded as uh, less stable. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And thank you. That's very interesting. Now we have a lot of questions. So now we're going to have uh, Moa Bursell. Yeah, she's already here in the spotlight. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, good. Hi. Great. Yeah, so so uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Yeah. So thank you. This is a fascinating uh, project uh, and study, uh, and I think it's super interesting. And I have many questions, but I think the rules are one question on each occasion. So I'm going to ask you one question now and then, or maybe two, and then raise my hand again. <laughs> so, 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 one, so one just really brief question at first. If you, so is this study published at this point? Sorry? Is, is the study published? Ha uh, Okay, that the question doesn't count. So you can okay. then have we are, we are in the, uh, we have an R&R &R from European Sociological Review. 
Okay, because I'm thinking, wouldn't it be a more representative sample to include? I mean, if, if you want to have a representative picture of the men and women in Europe applying for jobs, wouldn't you? Wouldn't it be fair to include a small portion of uh, minority people in the study? Because if I understood you correctly, you're using only the sort of native names at this point. Yeah, but that's not what it looks like, right? Yeah. Well, why, why don't you Why don't you include? include did, them? Did, did, okay, uh, this is this is difficult because there are um, uh, when you are part of a team, there are there is always a division of labor, and there's another paper. Uh, which is written by two of the younger people in, in the research team uh, that are looking at the uh, gender and ethnicity. Mm -hmm. right? Okay. So once you, uh, which is interesting, right? Very much interesting. But uh, once you include um, include um, minority groups, uh, we would need to uh, to relate to that theoretically as well, mm -hmm. and then we get into this uh, uh, there is a use as you know you know that <laughs> there's a huge literature on on uh, intersectionality and and what does it matter if you are uh, immigrant and woman or immigrant and man etc so then your work would be very relevant for instance but um, there is this division of labor and and it would be sort of expanding the paper um, mm. yeah do you think the result would change if that, if you would have included say 10 percent uh, of the uh, foreign named applicants, do you think this overall result would have changed, or would it be stable? I, I, I'm not quite sure. Mm. I'm not quite sure. Uh, we have we have started talking about actually number one. These data are now out there for anyone to to pick mm. uh, to use because we had a, we had a, yeah. A, yeah. So they are now available, uh, but we are we have started. Uh, but we haven't finished at all. But there, we have started on a paper where we look at gender and ethnicity and national differences, because the paper that is already published uh, look at occupational differences and and sort of because I mean the number of uh, uh, cases in this study is uh, so that you you cannot have all balls up at the same time. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, we will hopefully uh, do a paper where we look at the intersectionality argument in, in a cross-national perspective, but it's not going to be in this one. Okay, but thank it's you. Very good question. <laughs> very good. Mm. Okay, so you satisfied with that, Moa? Yes, I'm satisfied, and I'll come back later. Yeah. Yep. Okay, very good. So we should sign you up again then. Yeah. Uh, Paul to Streamling. You have to unmute yeah, yeah. yourself. Hear me? Yeah. 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 Thank you. Really interesting. It's good when people do this. It's a lot of work behind getting all of these observations from so many harmonized across. So it's good that someone is doing it. I was wondering, since you didn't find any country level differences, then you could pool all the data and just look at occupational differences, treating all the countries as if they are the same. Have you done that? And did you find any occupational differences then? Um, we haven't, we have done that. Oh my God. This paper has been going on for many years. Uh, <laughs> but we decided to, for, again, like I said, with the gender slash ethnicity logic, uh, we decided to focus on the national differences here. Uh, so it would be a different paper. Right. But uh, do you remember but if you found anything? I think that the finding is uh, if you uh, uh, check the occupational sex segregation argument is that this is uh, sort of uh, the same, you know, that it's the same occupations where we find uh, significant gender gaps and uh, not significant gender gaps. So the, the um, occupational differences are very, very much the same across countries. Right. No, I'm wondering if the discrimination, if you found any difference in discrimination on the occupations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, like I said, the um, uh, there are three out of the three occupations where there are significant gender differences in discrimination. And they are all, uh, they are all uh, in all these occupations, men are discriminated against. And, and there is no, no discrimination of women. 
in the um, uh, in the computer uh, development occupation, and uh, that has on average about fifteen percent uh, females uh, across countries. Um, so you could say that this is a typical male-dominated uh, occupation. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, this is why I am a little bit like that. I'm, I'm never happy enough, you know. <laughs> we, we should have more occupations, more male-dominated occupations to test that argument if there is a symmetry here. Mm -hmm. Because uh, the, um, uh, the computer industry is so different and so modern and people who work in, with data are, are, you know, nerds and they don't care about gender stereotypes that much i think so <laughs> that's my feeling so we don't find any any discrimination of women in that occupation right although the fact is that it is a male dominated occupation but it's not a kind of a typical male dominated no, occupation. i mean this you're right then I, I haven't seen this in any of this literature but there's a distinction in masculinity like yeah in, yeah maybe yeah so exactly computer nerds tend to be more androgynous in their presentation than say uh, and building sites or something like that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you anyway. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Okay, so then we should move on to the next question. And that is uh, minus Bigram. Oh, hopefully there he is. Minus? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Hi. Nice to see you. <laughs> yeah, just <fine. laughs> I have a couple of comments. Uh, I'm not sure if I should take them all. Uh, but yeah, I want to follow up on that thing on that Moa said on, on uh, immigrant names also. So uh, when we look at this for Sweden, we don't see any discrimination at all, uh, gender discrimination when we look at Swedish sounding names. So we, our results are very similar to the U.S. case here. Yeah. Uh, but then when, when you look at the immigrant uh, sounding or foreign sounding names, we see uh, uh, a discrimination of men. Not that much, but still uh, significant. So, so, and that's what they found in this Danish uh, study too, uh, which is published in ESR. Mm -hmm. um, so probably you will find that for Norway too. That's my guess. Um, okay, and I mean, you can use the whole data and then weigh by, I mean, weigh it so that it becomes uh, representative for, but you don't want to do that. So, uh, never I mind. Mean, uh, can, I, can I interfere? Um, can I interfere before you ask the question? Um, yeah, that's more, yeah, I don't have it, a question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, you could uh, um, you could argue that um, we could sample um, a, a proportion of the minority applications that would uh, uh, sort of uh, be uh, the image of the population in each country. So the minority population varies slightly across the countries that we have included, right? So you could say, okay, in our country, it's like 18% or something like that. But then on the other hand, that's not fair because you should look at people who are in the sort of age span, which is uh, relevant in, in the study. So we, in principle, we could do that. I think we would have fairly low numbers if we did that. Uh, so, but it could give some kind of a more correct picture of the labor market in these countries, because now we, as you say, we only address the majority population, to use that word. Um, so we could have included, for instance, in, in our country, if we look at the age span, we are talking about 22 to uh, 26 years old, uh, how many second generation people with uh, native education would be in that age span. And then we could have, have taken some of them from our study. Uh, it could be an interesting exercise, but I don't think we would have um, had power enough to say anything meaningful, really. So that's why I think the, um, the interesting study here is to look at, uh, at uh, to include all and, and look at uh, gender and ethnicity in a cross-national perspective. And that paper isn't written yet. Okay, I think my point is that you probably underestimate the discrimination of men. 
by looking at only uh, native yeah. sounding names. So that yeah. that so maybe you should perhaps mention that somewhere in your uh, when you discuss uh, well the external validity of, of your mm. of your approach. Mm -hmm. um, so an another point I had was that. Uh, so, you know about this welfare state paradox that uh, uh, gender gaps tend to be large in social democratic welfare states. Uh, I think you've written about <laughs> <laughs> I think I heard something about many that. Many years ago. So, um, <laughs> you can actually address that. I didn't see anything about that in your, in your uh, kind of uh, the, the country differences expectations so so you should bring that up we actually uh, wrote a paper about this but we only had one country so we, you want several countries uh, with variation in in, uh, uh, in uh, you know the family policy um, i mean parental leave rights etc because uh, there are some fairly strong views about this in in, in the literature that you should then see more uh, discrimination of women in a country like Norway compared to a country like Spain. So uh, you could you could actually address this this uh, question in your paper. Mm. Mm. Um, so that's, yeah, yeah, that that's a good point. Um, although I think that's some of the. Um, some of the reasons that uh, I remember Rachel Rosenfeld in the old days, she used to talk about this, that you would expect to find more discrimination of women in Scandinavian countries because the employment protection is so strong in Scandinavian countries. So this is one of the things we include in this table on cross-national differences in the countries included. Uh, so employment protection and, and the family policy which is uh, uh, allow women to take so much time out of the labor market uh, is also a reason why you should expect more statistical discrimination of women. Um, but we have moved on. I mean, uh, in Sweden and Norway, uh, men also now have a daddy leave of absence related to <laughs> to uh, childbirth, and and we have we become a little bit more equalized, I think, in gender terms in Scandinavia. So, so. Probably today I wouldn't expect them um, to find the same um, paradox as strong, at, at least. But it, it's um, it's a good... No, I, uh, yeah, I don't believe in this hypothesis. I think it's just wrong, but... Yeah. You can, you do, yeah, you can address it. Uh, okay. Final comment. I think... This, or, yeah, or can I... Should I wait? Yeah, you can come yeah. back. Because yeah. there are yeah. a lot of people who would like to ask yeah, questions. Sure. So shall we sign you up again for a, on the next yeah. round? Okay, we sign you up again for the next round. Okay. And then we can continue with uh, Anne Aronson. Yeah, there she is. Please. I think you need to unmute in some way. We can't hear you. Yes, do you hear okay. me now? Now we hear you. Great. Thank you for a very interesting presentation. I'm also oh. working with correspondence studies, partly mainly with the same data as Magnus, so Oh, you get my okay. questions instead now. <laughs> uh, uh, I also have many questions, but I, tr I try to limit myself. Um, first question, have you looked at the recruiter characteristics or the employer characteristics? I mean, like, for example, gender of the recruiter. Hmm. Uh, can you say anything point. about that? Uh, I can say that we don't have enough, uh, enough uh, high quality, quality data to, to rely on it. So we decided not to use it. It varies across the countries uh, whether this was um, um, documented in a proper way or not. But it's it's a very good point. If you are looking at the idea of homosocial reproduction, etc., mm -hmm. it's a very good point. Yeah. Yeah, I have a paper about that with Swedish data. Yeah, uh, good. Using recruiter tender. So that's why I was curious. Um, uh, just another question about immigrant background. Did you say for the immigrant background, I know you're not looking at this paper, but otherwise, are you actually looking at immigrant background there or just simply foreign name? Or is it like explicitly stated that they have like foreign education or something when you use in the project immigrants? Uh, that's a good question. Um, 
Hmm. I think, uh, yes, of course, we do have uh, the name. And I think this uh, was uh, re enforced uh, so number one we had the name and number two i think it was reinforced in the applications in two ways uh, first that people said that they would speak a specific language like for instance yeah. Urdu, uh, like mm -hmm. it. and then um, there is also one treatment on um, uh, religion slash uh, voluntarily work whether you work in a religious organization or if you work in some other organization and uh, and uh, there uh, the um, uh, for some but not all of course since this was randomized uh, you could say that there's a kind of an extra treatment uh, enforcing the uh, ethnicity um, uh, measurement Right, but you always have something else also besides yeah, just yeah, the name yeah, indicated. Yeah, not just okay. the name. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank mm -hmm. you. I might come yeah. back for a second round. Okay, thanks. Anybody up for the second round too? Was that you wanted? Good. <laughs> this is funny. Uh, you, are very, you are very systematic. <laughs> yeah, kind of. So we yeah. are now on the second round, actually. So, uh, and there's still time. If somebody comes up uh, who haven't asked a question, I will put, put you ahead of the crew. But the second round, so, so let me start that second round with uh, another unfair question, what you didn't do. No, but you, you mentioned that, of course, you looked at uh, the callback probability. That's what you get. And I guess uh, the callback probability is callback to when you call back a number of people for, uh, for an interview. So, of course, it, it is less costly to be uh, non-discriminatory, so to say, when you do that. Have you done or have other people done or are you planning to do studies where you look actually at the probability of being hired or the probability or, or, or actually the actual employment, how it looks? Okay, these kinds of data, I think at least I don't have fantasy to see how you can set up a correspondence study to look at the later phases in the hiring process. Um, like I said, in the US, the, um, they have had uh, audit studies where they actually train, uh, I know about um, uh, one study that's old, uh, from an ethical point of view, research ethics, it's a bit, uh, it's a bit not so nice, but um, they actually trained uh, students to go to interviews, because th then you get one step further down the road mm -hmm. in this process, mm -hmm. and, and to kind of fake who they were. And they were looking at discrimination, of, of, of course, related to race, uh, and um, they also have been uh, using hidden camera. And uh, yeah, I think the, from an ethical point of view, because the, of course the person who is interviewing them don't know about being part of a research project. So it's violating the usual rules of um, uh, research ethics that you should have informed consent when you okay. participate. So that's, that's a little extreme, but there are other, uh, so I wouldn't recommend that, <laughs> but there are, there are other data that uh, follows uh, hiring processes, but they are usually not uh, representative for the labor market, which our studies aren't necessarily either. But um, for instance, Tom Peterson uh, has had access to, to firm specific data and not only him, there are several studies as well where they follow uh, they can they can see uh, the whole process within one company from who was invited the gender or qualifications or ethnicity of them and then they follow who were invited for a second interview etc et and then all the way to the end uh, when you see who were hired and at what kind of wages and career prospects etc so there are studies who have gone through the whole process but I don't know how you would do that. With yeah, yeah, no, sorry for playing armchair sociologist here. I, I just worry from a policy perspective that we, we might miss uh, some discrimination when we only look at the callback uh, probability. Uh, but for example, with this study you did here, you couldn't get the, the actual hiring statistics afterwards from, from each of these? No, I think that would be difficult. Okay. Yeah, uh, I think so. Uh, but um, I think there are uh, there are so many people in the audience who also know about correspondence study now, so you should correct <laughs> me 
but I think there are there are one or two studies out who says that most of the discrimination occurs at the earliest stage of the hiring mm. process. And from a theoretical point of view, I would say that that makes sense because in particular, if um, some of these decisions are driven by employers' stereotypes, um, we as human beings are more likely to to um, uh, loosen up a little bit in this in the way we think about uh, uh, group members when we actually meet individuals. So well, I could have still... I, I, I just noticed I, on that that homophilia is less active when you meet people in person for interviews as compared to when you look at their CVs. Yeah, I mean, I I could, well, since I'm talking to, to you, I could say Norwegians, we have stereotypes about Swedes, <laughs> right? Uh, but when we meet you individually, we like you. <laughs> or we dislike you. <laughs> but the thing is that, no, but I mean, to, to be serious, I mean, when you actually uh, see people, uh, in an interview situation, even on screen like this, you, we are observing uh, thousands of things, right? So we are seeing an individual, not just a representative of a group. Mm -hmm. So you would expect then that if stereotypes is part of the explanation for discrimination, you would expect that, the, that um, there would be more uh, stereotypes involved in, in the first phase of the hiring process than later. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people who asked. Who I, I noticed that there was this flag. Someone wants to <laughs> to comment, so I'll be happy to hear what you think. Yeah, I think we have some follow ups on this. Actually, a lot of follow ups on this one. You're right. <laughs> uh, so first follow up is from uh, Karin Heldén. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. I'm sorry. I don't have. I apologize for not having my uh, my video on. I don't have a video here. <laughs> Uh, uh, thank you very much, Gun. This was really interesting. I just want to say uh, a quick comment related to, to the last uh, discussion, and that was a comment about affirmative action. So in a lot of countries, they have this kind of affirmative action where you would, at least for, you know, having the numbers looking correct to uh, invite an equal number or fairly equal number of men and women to an interview. And then um, mm -hmm. so it's, you know, it's it's often a policy in bigger companies that you would, you would apply this kind of affirmative action, uh, even though if you later hire a man, and that kind of counteracts your argument, you know, about that it happens in the first stages, because if you know that you would have to show for maybe a board or something, uh, what, what the gender of the candidates that are interviewed. Mm -hmm. And I mean, in Sweden, that's very common. I think in, for other countries too, certainly for Norway. So mm -hmm. I, I think that you cannot really ignore that kind of, that kind of issue. Um, Okay, um, thank you. I think that uh, this would be more, I, I agree, the, the, uh, life gets more and more complicated when you do this kind of corresponding studies. Uh, in this study, we have totally avoided public sector. And one reason is... Right, okay, right. Mm. And, and I think, uh, at least in our country, um, gender is, of course, still an issue, but, but uh, what is getting more and more... Um, addressed is the um, whether whether people with immigrant background are being called in for an interview right so but if you, in Sweden, affirmative action is only allowed uh, in addition to gender i don't know about norway but hmm. in sweden at least you're kind of encouraged to hire the underrepresented gender given hmm. that you know there are equal merits but hmm. not uh, in um, in accordance to, to ethnicity so it's only allowed for gender so yeah. Well, in our country, uh, in public sector, uh, when they advertise jobs, uh, they usually there is usually a sentence saying that um, people with um, immigrant background are encouraged to apply, and 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 uh, they are actually taking statistics that uh, I can't be sure if this is all a public sector, but uh, but uh, this is something that the boards will be interested in, right? So just to right. have a just to have a call back or even be invited for an interview could be just a kind of ritual act. Um, yeah, at least for bigger companies, maybe not for a small employer, but I would assume for the bigger companies, yes. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. It's a good comment. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah thank you very much for that. Uh, Moa, you had a follow up too. Yeah, okay, thank you. I th actually, I had not thought about what Karin was just saying, that it's different for gender, but I was just going to mention that for ethnicity, it's definitely like Gunn says. I know there's an old ILO study that shows that 90, that when they, when they conducted this audit uh, study, so first they send applications and then they send trained students to apply for jobs. And they mm -hmm. found that in 90%, 90 percent of all discrimination occurred in the initial step. Uh, mm -hmm. So when, at least in the cases when where there's no kind of compensation going on, like Karin was mentioning about, um, you know, that you're obliged to invite a certain number of, of uh, applicants, at least in these cases, 90% uh, of all discrimination occurs uh, in the first stage. So in this sense, you do, you do capture most of the discrimination, you know, in this initial step, and you avoid like, these ethical issues that Gunn was mentioning. Mm -hmm. So that was just, uh, just really brief yeah. about that. Yeah, and I guess nice. as well with this anecdotal thing that uh, people of other ethnicity often try to visit the company to just show themselves to kind of break through that kind of mm -hmm. uh, stereotyping. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry, good. It's... No, I mean, I said thank you, Moa. I, I agree. Yeah, I think you should join me in uh, thanking the speaker, Gun, for this very interesting talk. That's lovely. Many questions. Please go and stay on uh, at the end of this because uh, I, I, I'm going to ask you some questions. But uh, I should also <laughs> announce that we have uh, two research seminars coming up, actually connecting somewhat to this in a nice interdisciplinary way. We have Anka Gauss, who's going to speak on the 17th of March. What does it mean to have a gender identity? It connects ah. to one of the questions we had here. And then on March 24, Richard Arneson. Uh, should we reward the deserving some puzzles? So you're all very welcome to that. And thank you very much.